second talk of the morning is by Xi'an Gao, uh, who's speaking on, uh, found on the number of rational points on the curve. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, my talk is more on uh, is more on number theory, as a result on number theory. But in this proof, uh, minimal geometry plays a very important role here. Uh, I will explain where it is used. Um, first of all, let me start with the Fulton's theorem, which is known as the model conjecture. Um, fix g and v to the two integers. Uh, in the whole talk, C will be an irreducible smooth projective curve of genus G and defined over a number field of degree D. Uh, in 1983, Faltings proved this model conjecture saying that if G is, uh, is at least 2, <laughs> then uh, the curve has only finitely many rational points. And then the next question is to ask, is there a bound on it? Of course, this proof itself gives, gives a bound, but this bound is, is not very good, it's not a good one. Um, later on, in 1988, Voita gave a second proof to this, new, uh, to this uh, theorem. Um, his proof is on uh, Arakov geometry and Dufantine estimates and so on. But this proof was uh, simplified by Faltings and further simplified by Bombieri. And the, the last proof of Bombieri is purely Dufantine estimates. The Arakov uh, uh, part is removed. But from this new proof, it does give a good upper bound. This upper bound is in terms of the genus, the degree, and the height of its Jacobian, and the model we rank. Uh, moreover, uh, one can write really uh, this constant C uh, very explicitly, the dependence on G, D, and the height. Um, uh, meanwhile, at the same time, Mazur asked the following question. Um, his, uh, the, first, the first version of his question is, uh, a bit more general than this rational point setting. It says the following thing. If we fix any uh, algebraic point on this curve and take the Jacobian of it, and uh, we consider about Jacobi embedding y this point, then we can see c as a sub-variety, uh, as a curve inside this abelian variety j. Uh, let's take any finite rank subgroup. By finite rank, I mean the q rank. I mean the q rank. Let's take any finite rank subgroup. Then there is a bound on, this, on the cardinality of this gamma intersect with the C, with the algebraic point of C. It should depend only on G and the rank of uh, gamma. More pre uh, and there is a more precise uh, relation. Uh, so the rank should also uh, should only appear in the exponent and so on. Um, uh, very recently uh, in the in a collaboration with Veselin Dimitrov and Philip Habegger, we proved this result for uh, large curves, meaning that uh, we're we are not able to prove the full conjecture right now, <laughs> but what we can prove is that for any g, there is a, a number depending only on this g, such that if the height of this Jacobian is larger than this number, then uh, Mazur's conjecture holds. Well, this theorem already has some very good applications. Um, for example, if we go back to the uh, rational point problem, then uh, we can take this p0 to be a rational point and gamma to be the uh, to be jk. This is also uh, how people study model conjecture in general. And then this <laughs> this upper bound will give an upper bound on the uh, on the cardinality of the rational point. It depends on g, d, and the, the model we rank. There's no height involved in this bound. And also the dependence on D is somehow very artificial here. It appears in the following way. Uh, say in our theorem, we're restricted to curves with large heights. So we need to deal with curves with small heights. And for those curves, uh, either by not scott property, if this curve is defined over a number field of bounded degree, then there are only finitely many of them. So we just apply Fulton's theorem to every one of them, or to the twist of every one of them, then we get uh, this bound here. Otherwise, we can also, uh, uh, simpler ways to uh, uh, use a result of k -Mon. He showed that this bound is in G, D, and the Fulton Titan, uh, the, the rank. So there are two ways. Uh, but essentially, this D appears here only be because we're, we're not able to deal with the small curves. And, but they are finite, uh, fortunately, they are only finitely of them if we fix such a D. Uh, of course, this also gives uh, an evidence that this D should be removed 
in the uh, in the in the bound in the end. And second, if we take this gamma to be the torsion uh, to the to the subset of torsion points, we call that this gamma. In in our case, gamma can be uh, the Q rank. Uh, we we'll just talk about the Q rank. And this gamma, this new gamma, it has Q rank zero. So there, the rank gamma is zero. So that now this outer bound it becomes a, a bound for the size of torsion packets on C. Uh, this is towards a uniform many manifold conjecture. We consider a curve and in, uh, in, a, in a Banner variety, we intersect with the torsion points of that Banner variety. And uh, this will give a bound uh, in the form of G and B. Again, B is here because we are not able to deal with small curves, but it's still very artificial. All right. Uh, some previous results in this uh, uh, direction of removing the faulting's height on the dependence, as, as, uh, as I know. Um, for rational points, David and Philippon proved this result when J is a subvariety of uh, copies of elliptic curves and some, uh, some technical, uh, other, other technical hypotheses. Uh, in the same year, with Dan Kamaye, they also uh, prove this result for some particular families of curves. Actually, for each uh, family, uh, for, for each G, at least four, they found infinitely many families of curves satisfying this property. Some examples. Uh, these proofs use different time estimates, as we do. Are, they are based on the proof of Voita. Um, uh, there are other ways to, uh, to study this problem, uh, notably by the Coleman Shabotin method. Uh, for example, uh, Michael Stahl proved this result one uh, for hyper elliptic curves, uh, hyper elliptic curves, and the, the, when the rank is g minus three. And Cass Ravenoff strike wrong, uh, generalizing Michael Stahl's proof. They proved this this result when the rank is small. Again, this is uh, due to the nature of the Shabotin Coleman method. Uh, they are restricted to small rank cases. Um, very recently, Levant Alpozo, a PhD student at Princeton, um, he proved this result for, uh, basically he proved this result for G equals 2. Um, he computed average rank of rational points on genus 2 curves. Uh, he, he showed that it, it is finite. Uh, yeah, and his proof is also based on Voita's one. For algebraic torsion points, again, in the same paper, Cass Ravenoff and Strike wrong. Uh, they proved this kind of this bound, assuming some good reduction behavior, because they need to use um, the uh, Berkowitz uh, space, uh, Berkowitz space at, at some uh, some prime. Uh, and Dermarco, Krieger, and Ye, they proved this result for bi-elliptic curves, but their result is an actual uniform many-manifold uh, many result, in the sense that in their dependence. This is uh, actual. This is stronger than ours in this particular case. Okay, uh, I'll sketch uh, the proof. But first of all, as our proof is based on the Voita's proof, so let me quickly recall some main ingredients in the proof. First of all, uh, we just uh, study everything on the uh, on the Jacobian on uh, JQ bar. There is a height function. This is called the Nihon height function. It is defined as follows. Let's take any symmetric ample line bundle on this J. Um, and then uh, we define uh, the classical height function. And then we take the sort of tape limit process. And it becomes an actual function. It's not only a class of function. It's an actual function. This function uh, goes from the algebraic points of J to non-negative Real, uh, real <laughs> numbers, and it vanishes precisely on the torsion points. If we restrict to a finite rank subgroup of JQR, say this gamma, then uh, it will extend uh, linearly to a function gamma tensor. Uh, here I write Z, but if it's a Q group, then it's tensor Q. Uh, if it's a uh, Z group like JK, then it's tensor Z. The gamma tensor R to uh, the uh, set of non-negative real numbers. Well, this function satisfies some very good properties, like it is quadratic. Uh, it is quadratic, meaning that if we take a point P, 
and take a number n, then the height of np is n squared, the height of p. This is because, uh, as I said, I fixed this L to be symmetric. So we have a norm Euclidean space like this. Or a <coughs> more correct way is to say that here we take not h hat L, but h hat hat, hat L uh, square root. But yeah, this is a norm Euclidean space. And this gamma, now if we take a finite, finite generated subgroup, then it becomes a lattice. Um, for simplicity, uh, I, I, I would like to restrict myself on finite rank subgroups. You can think of JK when seeing this. The rational point is probably uh, more interesting to more people. Um, then we have this picture. The dotted points are, uh, are formed the lattice gamma, and the whole space is the Euclidean space. Uh, we have this norm H hat, H hat L. On this Euclidean space, we draw a ball. What Voita did is that he found a number r such that if we consider the ball of radius r, we divide those points, those lattice points, into two sets. The points with norms smaller than r are called the small points, and larger are called large points. And <coughs> moreover, uh, this r can be chosen to be linear in terms of any height of j, any reasonable height of this j. Um, the good thing is, um, well, first of all, just by looking at this picture, if we want to see finiteness property, say the, uh, then the small points are automatically finite because it is they are lattice points inside <coughs> A ball, a closed ball. Of course, there are only finite many of them. So when proving model conjecture, uh, nothing needs to be done for the small points. Essentially, we only need to prove the finiteness of large points. But that is the hard part for model conjecture. Uh, it is proved using manifold scale principle and the so-called Voita inequality. And moreover, uh, the Diago proved that. Um, the number of large points not only is finite, but also it has very good bound. This bound is also only in terms of g, which is very explicit, the cg, and 7 to the power of the rank of this gamma. Um, this, because the proof uses essentially just the Manthold's gap principle and Voita's inequality, and both these inequalities uh, apply to actually uh, Qbar points, not only those lattice points. So the proof, uh, so the result also holds for any finite rank subgroup. Uh, a more detailed, uh, a more detailed proof is given by David Bergeron and Trimo. So the number of large points, whatever, uh, whatever gamma we take, it's bounded in this way. Only in terms of g and the rank. So if we want to prove a good bound, now. The large points, the number of large points already has a good bound. So, uh, in order to prove Mather's conjecture, we only need to study the small points, which which was the easy part for the model conjecture. But now it becomes the hard part. Um, so, if uh, in order to uh, study Mather's conjecture, uh, it suffices to prove something in the following uh, in the following direction. We want to show that those small points, they are far from each other. They are sort of very discrete. The, the easiest way to form this discreteness is that, okay, their distance are large. The, the, recall that their norm are, are bounded linear in terms of the, of the height. So if their distance are bounded below linear in terms of the height, then when we do basic Euclidean geometry, this part and this, this height and this height just cancel out, and we have the bound for the number. We have the good bound for the number. But of course, uh, this is the idea we want to have. We want to work into this towards this direction, but in the end, actually, such an equality will not hold anyways. <laughs> but this is what we want. So we just try to prove something as close as to, uh, as to this one. 
and fortunately we will be, uh, it will be done in the process. But let's see how to do it. Um, first of all, um, I would like to explain this. Uh, I would like to plan, uh, explain this result in one-parameter families. And the main point is to use the following height inequality proved by uh, Heidegger and myself. Uh, uh, say S is a curve over Q bar, not necessarily projective. Well, in general, it's not projective. Let's apply it be an abelian scheme over this curve. So now we have like a one parameter family of abelian varieties. Uh, we fix a relatively ample symmetric line bundle on A and take an irreducible sub variety of A. Let's assume it dominates to S. It does. Um, the inequality has actually two parts. The first part says that if x satisfies some good property, then we have a height, we have a comparison of two heights. Here exists a constant and a Zarsky dense open a Zarsky open dense subset U such that if we consider the Nihon phase height fiberwise defined on the left hand side, it is bounded below by the height function on the base. Let's write it actually on the left hand side. Left hand side, this Nihon phase height is just the Nihon phase height we talked before, but now fiber wise, on each fiber, it's precisely that one. The right hand side is a height function on the base. Um, of course, the pose for all points in this U. Um, well, um, <coughs> first, uh, let, let's look at this height inequality. Uh, a priori, there's no reason that there is any relation between the height on the left and on the right. Because the left hand side, it's really fiber wise defined. And the right hand side, it, it depends completely on the base. They have no relation. We can't expect to relate such a height to such a height. But the key point of our height inequalities is that if we choose to work in the sub variety, and if this sub variety satisfies some property, which is called non degenerate, and I will define it later, then there's a comparison of this data between these two points. And of course, afterwards we need to we need to say what is this non degenerate, whether it's checkable given any x. And in this case, uh, yes, uh, we prove that x is degenerate if and only if x is uh, very rigid in geometry. I mean like a building uh, sub scheme translated by a torsion section and then translated by a, like a constant sub variety. Constant means that okay, a over s it may have a constant part, and then uh, this constant part may uh, may have some constant uh, sub varieties and so on. So here in this in this in this part, we see that given any x, this in geometry is in general not hard to check. And if we can check that some x is non degenerate, then we can go back and apply this height inequality. Um, let me see. Uh, Let's see how it how it proves uh, Mather in for one for my parameter families. Let's take a one parameter family of curves. For simplicity, I'll assume G is at least three for the moment. Uh, we'll, I will explain how to how to generalize to G equals two in the end. Uh, assume that it is not as a trivial. Then we have a relative Jacobian. Now this relative Jacobian will be the abelian, variety, abelian scheme that we study. First, but first of all, uh, let's see what is this x. This x is defined in the following way: the, for, uh, the morphism c times c, fiberwise defined by p minus q, <coughs> it defines a sub variety of J. Um, this is, let's call it c minus c. It is very reasonable because restricted to each fiber is precisely the c minus c. So, the good thing about c minus c with respect to C is that, well, we need to embed, when we embed a curve into its Jacobian, we need to choose a base point. But if we take C minus C, then this base point always cancel out. So C minus C is in is a canonical sub variety. It doesn't depend on the choice of base point. Um, now, the good thing about G 
at least three is that now C minus C is not, not hard to try, check that this is non-degenerate. It's not constant. Um, so we can apply the height inequality, which says precisely this. The points are uh, P minus Q on the fiber. And this, uh, this point on the base is this X. And uh, that's more or less precisely the, the height of the the height of the Jacobian. Well, this is almost precisely what we want for Maser. Something different is that here we add a constant so that uh, we are only able to prove it for large curves because if this height, this height is small enough, then we cannot say anything new about uh, about this distance. But on the other hand, but on the other hand, some restriction on this p minus q is contained must be contained inside this RSQ open dense subset but this is really minor problem by any induction or just because u is RSQ dense open so those bad pairs are uh, they, they are they are located on a very small subset of x and uh, it's anyway you able to deal with those points uh, so uh, this basically proves uh, this proves Mazur's conjecture for one-parameter families. Uh, let's see here in this case it is this inequality that we have. It's almost the one we wanted. All right, now um, we need to generalize this to arbitrary parameter families of curves and. To prove Mazur's conjecture, of course, um, that arbitrary family will be like the universal, uh, the modular space and the universal curve. But before going on, uh, let me say something more about this height inequality because I didn't say what is non-degenerate. I just give a criterion. But why such a what? Why such a non-degeneracy? What is this non-degeneracy? Why it implies this uh, height inequality? Uh, here I want to give a hint. This is this is a hint. Well, let's look at this height inequality. <coughs> Let me write it in this way: c times the fiberwise height plus some other constant is at least the height on the base. First of all, c prime comes from the height machine, so let's temporarily just forget about it in geometry. And for l, we can normalize it such that it is trivial along the zero section. It won't change the mahon tate uh, height, because anyways, mahon tate height is fiberwise defined. But the good thing uh, after the normalization is that now this fiberwise mahon tate height is more or less the same to the height, the naive height defined by l, by this curly l. And this height function on the base, uh, it is just defined by an ample line bundle on the base, on the compactification of the base. So this height inequality beca becomes the comparison of two line bundles. On the left-hand side, we have this L, curly L. On the right-hand side, we have this curly M. And um, so this height inequality says, OK, some power of this L is bigger than this m, or pi inverse m. And this is what we want. So, uh, so this, is the, this is what the height, in, uh, height inequality in geometry means. Well, now if everything is compact, is projective, then the big line, then the theory of the, the height machine theory and the big line bundle, they have a sort of dictionary. Uh, if we want to prove something like this, then it's enough to say, okay, L restricted to this X is a big line bundle. Then if L restricted to X is a big line bundle, then uh, given any M, we can take a large power of L such that this NL minus M restricted to this X, it, it's also big. It's like ample line bundle. So in the, at the end of the day, if we want to define some sub variety x to be non-degenerate, it should reflect the fact that this L restricted to x, it is a big line bundle, as in algebraic geometry. Well, what I said, if everything is projective, then it's almost an actual proof. You just need to write it down in mathematical terms. It's, it's, it will become an actual proof. But 
in our case, actually, like the you know, the modular space, they are not projective, so we need to do many many more things to deal with this problem. But at least here, um, I, I, at least here from this digestion, uh, we can see that how how this man degeneracy should be defined. Okay, and uh, then. Uh, I would like to talk about this non-degeneracy for arbitrary family of abelian varieties, and we will see how to get some criteria. Um, okay, now let's turn to the general case. Now we have the modular space of, uh, of curves, and uh, adding some level structures, we will have a universal curve that always exists, like level 4 structure or level 3, uh, level three structure. As before, we have CG minus CG, is a well-defined variety in, its Jaco in the relative Jacobian, canceling the base point. Um, one step further, well, CG and MG, for me, they are just too hard to study because their, the arithmetic of MG is not very clear. But something good is this modular space of abelian varieties and the universal family. They are Shimura varieties or mixed Shimura varieties, so there's a whole bunch of group theory and hot theory that we can use to study this. And all of these are well written in Berlin, Berlinski, and Pink, and so on. So let's furthermore put everything here. Uh, we have, this is a partition diagram. And this map is given by the Abel Jacobi map. And this Abel Jacobi map is injective or finite to one if we consider level structure. Anyways, it won't, uh, we won't lose information of dimensions and so on. So after having this diagram, so I, I actually will just do straight to the blue part. Okay, everything will be in this <laughs> universal abelian variety. So uh, our setting becomes, now we have the universal abelian variety, 30 AG, bracket AG, and a sub-variety inside that. We want, to, we want to study when is this X non-degenerate, as we <laughs> said before. So again, we also want a um, we also want a uh, an ample line bundle or relatively ample line bundle on it, and that exists uh, very topologically, because the modular space of abelian varieties every point does not only parametrize an abelian variety but also with the polarization. So there's a line bundle, uh, there's a canonically existed line bundle already. So well, we have a topological line bundle, uh, but to but to write it down in a correct way, we need to take some level, uh, even level structure and so on. But I will not go into that. And this kind, this topological symmetric relative uh, ample line bundle, it's almost by definition is trivial along the zero section. So this is the line bundle we want to study. We want that this LG restricted to some x. It is like big in some sense. Mm. Um. In algebra geometry, when we check a line bundle restricted to something is uh, when we check a line bundle is big, uh, one very uh, efficient way is that so if this line bundle is nef, meaning that it's net negative, then we just do the integral. We just take uh, we just take a, a one one form representing its first chain class and raise it to the correct wedge power and then do the integral on x. If that integral is positive, then it's big, and uh, vice versa. So let's see whether we can say something like that. Uh, fortunately, yes. So first of all, let's consider a uh, one-one form representing this first chain class. Uh, it is always net negative because this line bundle is nef. So uh, let's just define this subvariety to be non-degenerate in this way. Okay? Although, although nothing is compact, but still, this can be checked. This is a well-defined thing. This is a well-defined thing. <coughs> it's non if, if raising to the correct wedge power is not identically zero. So that if we do the integral, well, if we can do the integral, it won't be zero. It will be positive. Vaguely speaking, this means that it is big. Well, it's not projective, so... Okay, um, but still, this thing is not so easy to study at the moment. Uh, 
one better way to study it, first of all, if we can really write down this one one form explicitly, it may help. And it is the case. Uh, in this case, uh, everything can be written down very explicitly. Uh, let me explain. Uh, this is the Shimura theory that I talked about before. Um, let HG be the Ziegel upper half space, and then we'll have a uniformization in the category of contact spaces for the uh, modular space. We also want to have a similar stuff for the universal Abelian variety, and it is constru constructed as follows. First of all, as a real algebraic sub subset, a real algebraic set, we define as curly uh, X2G to be just the trivial product of R2G times the Ziegel upper half space. And then we need to give it a complex structure to talk about the uniformization. And this complex structure is given by the tracing equation to ABZ map to A plus ZVZ. Then we have a very uh, simple two form on this X2. I will denote by A and B, RG and R, uh, RG times R2G. Uh, this two form defined on X2G, uh, it descends to a 1 1 form on, a, on curly AG because of the following reasons. First of all, this two form is on this uh, Euclidean part, R2G. And the action, the translation, keeps the two form, doesn't change the two form. That's uh, very easy to check. And secondly, there is the symplectic group acting on both parts, both this one, we know how it acts, and this part, the symplectic group acts on R2G. And this symplectic group, of course, it preserves this this two form da wedge db it's almost the definition of the symplectic group so this two form actually it's invariant under a reasonable group action and pink theory or even back to Berdinsky, they they show that this ag it is its uniformization quotient out by some uh, congruence group of of that group i said and because this two form is invariant by that group, so it descends on AG. And one can also prove also prove that this is a representative of the first chain class. It's really by computation it can be done, uh, but everything can be found in a paper of Naming uh, Mock. Uh, in uh, when he studied the model way theorem for Abelian varieties over function field. Uh, the upshot is that um, this two form it becomes a one one form, and this is the one one form we want to study. And that one one form it <coughs> defines a screw symmetric linear form, and written down in this way, every very explicit. We can write down the kernel very simply. It's just the, the constant, it's just the, the the part on the Euclidean uh, part constant. So this is this kernel. Um, now, if this kernel, um, uh, now let's, uh, let's see how to use this to study the non-degeneracy. Uh, recall that this is how I defined non-degeneracy here. And if we have the kernel, if we have the kernel, then something is non-degenerate if and only if this X, it won't contain any germ. Uh, any germ uh, of this form, of this kernel, in complex geometry. All right. Uh, probably uh, a language which is more friendly to Dufontan estimators is the following Betty map, defined by uh, Bertrand, Zanier, Master, Calvara, and Henri, and so on. They have used this this map uh, in a <laughs> in some particular cases to study relative many model conjecture since a long time, but very recently they gave it the actual name and asked explicitly the question to study to study this map. Uh, this map is the definition is very simple. Uh, it's just the projection of the space to the first component. 
and it is real analytic but with complex uh, fibers. The fibers are complex also, it uh, also is very reasonable because the periods vary holomorph holomorphically, so the fibers are complex. Uh, by discussion in the previous slide, uh, if some x is non-degenerate, uh, then if equivalently uh, it won't contain any germ, and it won't contain any germ with con uh, any germ which is like constant in the horizontal direction. It won't contain any germ in the horizontal germ. So while we do this projection, we will lose nothing basically. We will lose no dimension. So uh, an equivalent way is to say that okay, if we take this beta map B here, we take its uh, differential and restrict it to X. Then uh, we will have to say we'll get the same dimension. We'll get the same dimension. Uh, so this is uh, in the end. This is the definition we will use for non-degenerate. The Betty map will have this rank to be exactly the rank of X. When we do this projection, nothing is lost in the horizontal direction. Um, before going on, I would like to say that okay, there is a there is a very simple counterexample to this non-degeneracy. So, if the dimension of X is larger than the relative dimension of the abelian variety, abelian scheme, then of course it's is degenerate because the, the, this this number cannot be more than two G. The images are two G. So if this holds, then this x will, of course, be degenerate. It's a very simple counterexample to that. But uh, the key point is that the key point is that we're able to prove that this is essentially the only reason why something is degenerate. Essentially, the only reason. I'll explain what that means. Okay, now the proof. Finally, it comes to the functional transcendence, and I like the intersection part, and that is where O minima minimality is vastly used. Um, First of all, uh, to study this uh, non-degeneracy, we use functional transcendence, uh, or more precisely, is the axiom or the weak version. Um, I guess many of you know this kind of axiom result, but let me repeat it. Uh, and also in geometry, we, we actually care more about this weak version. Um, that Q uh, from omega to S with subjective polymorphic morphism. Uh, uh, between algebra varieties is basically a uniformization such that both omega and uh, s have some algebraic structure but the, but the uniformizing map is very transcendental. Let's take uh, any complex analytic subvariety in the uniformizing space then we have such an inequality. Uh, if we take the dimension of the Zarsky closure of z in the uniformizing space plus the dimension in s the Zarsky order in S is greater or equal to the dimension of C plus the dimension of the bi Zarsky closure, meaning the smallest uh, bi algebraic subvariety of S containing that. Um, uh, the actual X channel will be to somehow put these two together. So we consider the product, the graph, and so on. Um, uh, first, uh, the first results on this uh, geometry part. Of, of course, this is the geometric uh, functional, tra functional analog of, X, uh, of the, of the Shannon uh, conjecture. And it was proved, first of all, by X in, seven, in the 71 for torus, algebraic torus. And then he actually, pro he actually proved it very uh, later on for all semi-abelian varieties in 1973. Uh, but uh, then Jacob Zimmerman found a new proof to access theorem for algebraic torus using O minimality. And that is when uh, these results also can be uh, gener uh, generalized. Uh, for example, Mark Pila and Zimmerman proved this result for uh, modular space. And Becker and Zimmerman proved this result for variation of any pure hard structures. Uh, I proved it for this universal abelian variety, which we will use to study the Betty map. And in all these proofs, O minimality is extensively used. 
uh, is actually the story. I think it actually goes back to the new proof of many method conjecture by Pila and Zanye, uh, based on what and Pila proved the Andrew Alt conjecture for the product of modular curves, in which they use O minimal theory to 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 prove uh, to study Andrew Alt conjecture, and during during which functional transverse since uh, since applications. And then it, that, but that was a particular case of this X channel. Uh, and later on, uh, Pila and Zimmerman started working on the more general X channel, and uh, they proved it with mock for all Shimura varieties. And these are the generalizations. Okay. And in studying the Betty map, it's uh, it's this result which will be used for the universal identity variety. All right. So uh, let's see how this unlikely intersection, uh, how this non-degeneracy can be translated to a purely unlikely intersection problem on, on this universal identity variety. Um, this is the picture that we have for uniformizations. And x is inside the universal identity variety, which is what we want to study. And let's take the component of u inverse x. Um, by what we talked before, X is degenerate if and only if uh, we lose uh, we lose uh, something when we do the projection to R two G. That means at each point we lose something, so that X theta, if we study each point of this X theta, it will contain a germ, a horizontal germ, which we can write in the following form. Sorry, this is a horizontal. I have a horizontal germ is in this way. X theta will be something like this. It's, it's the union of such things. And then we apply the uniformization to both sides. We have this. Um, the point is now X is algebraic. So we can take its RC broker of each number on the right hand side. So X is degenerate if X is the union of something the union in that form you uh, the uniformization of some horizontal germ and then we take the RC closure uh, taking the RC closure uh, has some practic practical advantage because it's germ this germ itself is hard to study but the RC closure it's easier uh, let's see how to how to do that well apply mix X channel to this germ it's, uh, R times C tuta. And then we have this is what we have for the exact channel. Well, the second term in this inequality it is precisely the y that we want to study. So let's not do anything with like that. <coughs> and the third term is just one. And the fourth term is a bijects RC closure. We know that bioalgebraic uh, sub varieties have very good uh, properties. So uh, uh, so let, let's let's not do uh, so. We don't need to we don't need to handle that in general. So the, the, the thing to handle is the first part. And let me write it in the form of the first part. Okay. Um, the first part actually, if we take the RC closure of R times C tuta, uh, a non-trivial but not hard uh, property is that this RC closure it. Um, meets with this trivial product in a way that we can first of all do the Darcy closure of the second part and then do this product, or we can first of all do the product and then the Darcy closure. The advantage is that now in this part we can be forget we can be forgotten. It doesn't it doesn't change the dimension. Now everything becomes if, if the dimension of C2 has R, then we're completely in the base. We're completely in the base, and it's not hard to show this property. This Darcy closure is a smaller than phi Darcy closure of the top one, by definition of one. So from this one, we have this inequality. The dimension of y is greater than the dimension of y by r minus the dimension of phi y by r. Um, uh, maybe I, I would like to say something. Um, I said that bioalgebraic uh, sub varieties have very good geome geometry, a uh, geometric interpretation, and here it is. This number 
it's precisely the small the the relative dimension of the smallest like abelian subscheme inside this ag curly ag which contains y so by uh, by that i mean first of all we need to restrict to some part of the base and then on this base this abelian scheme will not be simple it will have abelian subschemes and so on and then we allow translates by like torsion sections and, uh, and constant sections and so on and for that we can talk about like the essentially smallest abelian scheme containing this y and the relative dimension is precisely this it's precisely this so this it's like okay the dimension of y is bigger than the dimension of the relative dimension so it is actually what we said before is the trivial corner example for is for something to be non-degenerate and okay now we have that x is degenerate if and only if x is the meaning <coughs> of such things but by what i said before uh everything every y in this in this uh, union will be degenerate so if we take the union they will still be degenerate so the other direction also holds okay so it looks better now if x is degenerate then X is the union of something, and this something they satisfy some unlike intersection property. Although this union is still uh, an infinite union, so the next step is to do is to show that this union is actually a finite union, and uh, this can be done. Uh, the idea actually goes back very long, uh, at least to Bogomolov. He proved the following results in the seventies: uh, for any abelian variety and any sub variety. There are only finitely many abelian sub varieties of positive dimension satisfying those two properties. First of all, some translate of this B is containing X, and secondly, uh, say B is maximal for the property described in 1. Uh, some people call this long, loca long locus or Wurno locus, and so on. There are many names to that. I didn't find a uniform one. Uh, well, actually, this, this theorem. Um, it, uh, there, there are recently many generalizations of the, this theorem, all using O minimality. Uh, so the, the, the original theorem wasn't proved using O minimality, but the, the generalizations to study Andre Ott and uh, Zero Pin conjecture, they are all proved using O minimality. Uh, first one, in UMO proved the corresponding result for pure chimera varieties. And there is a way to define this so called translate of abelian sub varieties they will be called uh they are actually called the weekly special sub varieties uh there's a definition for that and Habegger and pila to study zero pin conjecture they introduced the notion of weekly optimal sub varieties and they prove uh, some finalness results in this direction for this uh, weekly optimal sub varieties for uh, uh, the copy, uh, a copy of modular curves. And Dao and Zhen proved this finite result of uh, weekly optimal sub varieties for pure Shimura varieties. And based on this result, I proved it for mixed Shimura varieties or um, the universal identity variety. And this is what we're going to use. So this says that, okay, everything in this, uh, if, we talk, if we consider this union, if you only consider those maximal y's, then they come from finitely many families. So in the end, it will become a finite union. If it's a finite union, moreover, everything can be written down using the uh, Shimura data, Shimura data, Shimura varieties, and so on. So it is possible to do some computation. Um, so now we have a criterion for something to be non-degenerate. It's written in the following way. I need to fix some notation. First of all, uh, for simplicity, I'll call this x s be pi of x, so that everything is in this smaller this restriction of a Billing scheme. We also assume that x is not contained in the proper subgroup scheme of A over s. Otherwise, we just replace this A over s by the smallest one. Then, x is degenerate if and only if the following holds. There exists a Billing subscheme such that if we do this function first of all and then do the modular interpretation modular map then this dimension of the image is smaller than the dimension of x minus the difference of this shimmer. x 
or this is the relative dimension of this b, or remember this is rather than dt, this is rather than gt prime, so that we have the relative dimension g minus g prime. Uh, let's see why this says that essentially anything non -degen anything degenerate will be that will, will come from that trivial counter example. Um, if we do this, then first of all, with then, uh, then first of all, here we have the dimension of iota x. Here, the relative dimension in doing this, the, well, for the fact none, we lose at most twice this thing, twice the relative dimension of b. The relative dimension of b. Because when we do this projection, that is precisely the most the most thing which can be lost. So actually, if so actually, um, the dimension of x will be more than, <coughs> so if x is, so if this is holds, um, then uh, here we lose g minus g prime, and uh, here we have, uh, here we have <coughs> x. So in the end, um, it's this counter example for iota x. So if x is degenerate, then we can find a, a Berlin subscheme such that it becomes the trivial counterexample after this operation. So this thing actually, in geometry terms, it's uh, not very hard to check. Well, also in general, this is the best thing we can get. We can't get something as clean as before. Although if s takes some very particular form, like if s is a curve or s has simple monodromy group, then we have something a lot simpler than this. But in general, this is the best we can do. Uh, but uh, we can still check it. Back to our original question, if we take cg minus cg, then uh, unfortunately, just by <coughs> the dimension reasons, it's uh, degenerate. It's, it's like the con a trivial counter example because the dimension is too large with respect to g. But now we have our criterion. So what we can do is we take the fiber product of that. We can take the fiber product of that. We are at the same time raising the relative dimension, at the same time raising the dimension of x. But the, but the relative dimension goes a lot faster. So if we take this m to be large enough, then it will be non-degenerate. It can be checked using the criterion before. Um, this says, OK, we cannot prove that uh, any two algebraic points are far from each other as we uh, expected, but we, but we can show that, okay, around each algebraic point, there are not many of them which are not far. And this is 3g minus 3, we can look at it loosely. Um, and this is good enough for, for a bound. Uh, of course, in the process, this 3g minus 3 is raised every time we do some very subtle, uh, subtle details, but anyway, this is the idea. And uh, we have some better map, actually, which also deal with g uh, equals 2. That is the faulting strong map, uh, fiber-wise defined by matching p1, pn, p0, pdm, to the difference of that. And if we take m to be large enough, then actually the mh will be non-degenerate for, uh, for m large enough. This also holds for g equals 2. So uh, we can get our result. The finite result again around each algebra points. There are not many of them, uh, which are not far. Uh, I'll stop here. Thomas, uh, Thomas. Let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>